I have to say, I like, like Barbara Windsor to get the logo uh, in. Hello, and welcome to Talking About Who. I've already got an accent. I mean, where's my boxer? Um, they're doing slightly offensive impersonations of me right now, and I, you know, actually that hurts my heart, because we should all be kind to one another. Um, I am Paul, or p Bell. Like me, share me, do what you will. Um, I'm joined by... Hello, it's James. And hello, it's Jason. <laughs> um, pre- previously on Talking About... See, I can all the accents. Previously. Um, <laughs> we, um, we, we haven't been high scoring on season 20. I'm not going to lie, as the kids would say here. Um, our current leader has got 17 points, and that is Snake Dance, which is followed by Mordren and Bed on 14 and a half, Ark of Infinity on 13, and our lowest um, scoring story ever. It's Terminus down there on the old three. And Jason said he would have given it naught if he could. So I think I, I think I think it's lucky at three. <laughs> I would have. I just didn't know if naught was actually something oh. we were giving any, you know, we've never done it before. Pity the term. I don't think anyone's going to start the hashtag justice for terminus. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> anyway, two more stories to go. Can anything steal a lead here? Um, our first story today is enlightenment. In what way? In every way. Did neither of you watch it? That's the point. <laughs> Oh, it's a, it's a golden star, isn't it? I was, I was waiting for you to flash a hardback there. Yeah, so I was giving you your hardback moment. My perfect moment. My, my hardback moment. Sadly, it is out, Mum and Dad. So if you if you contact them, they will sell you either <laughs> copy at a reasonable rate, I feel sure. Uh, go on, Jason. Are you going to start us off with this one? Do you, do you want me to start then, James? Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, I want to just get this lining because I love this. Hoist the mainsails there because we are in a sailing inspired story here. The TARDIS is under repair and the final battle of the Guardians looms. Um, <clears throat> okay, season 20 has seemed a very long season so far. Um, but actually, this isn't the worst story of the season. Uh, it's one of the better ones, I would say. Certainly better than Term- Terminus anyway. Um, and I know that's saying a lot. Uh, it marks the end of the trilogy that we've been following. So that's obviously the, the last three stories. And obviously we're coming up now to um, the Black Guardian's plan becoming a little bit unveiled here. Um, we're on space sailing ships. So we've got sailing ships in space, which I think is a wonderful concept. Um, and the winner takes all. Hmm. We'll find out. Will the winner take all with enlightenment? That's the thing, isn't it? Jason, um, I, lo- I love your intros. What the, the Black Guardian's plan being on that? What is the Black Guardian's plan? Yeah. Well, that is the point, isn't it? Because it's like all Guardian stories. I mean, if you think about going back to the key to time season, um, it, all, it all just sort of happens really quickly. You get the sort of white and Black Guardian having a little bit of a face-off for a couple of minutes, and then it's all over and done with, and the Black Guardian is defeated. So he must have had some sort of plan sitting underneath this, because he's, he's had Turlo under his control for the last three, three stories, um, trying to kill the Doctor. But what was the plan? Well, there must have been a plan. I don't know what the plan was. I've only watched the stories. <laughs> Because the weird, the weird thing is that it's actually um, enlightenment. Clearly, clearly, the Black Guardian is in collusion with Rack because that's how she's destroying all the ships. So that seems like something he's doing with her, and the Doctor lands in it. So it, it, I, I don't. Know. The White Guardian sort of pushes them in that direction, but it's kind of like it doesn't feel like that's particularly related to the Turlo thing, which for three stories now has just been. Kill him, boy! And then he doesn't, and it's like... And then so Black Guardian spends quite a bit of time in this episode saying to Turlo, well, you're going to die now. You know, he he gets trapped in that um, vacuum room and he just says, I told you you were going to die. Um, And then you get this... I know we're skipping ahead to the end. I think that's just wishful thinking. But then you get this, this whole 
end piece where you've got the white and the black guardian sat opposite each other with enlightenment in the middle and that they offer it to the doctor and the doctor says you know i don't i don't want it and you you've got all these sort of um the the eternals that are sort of using people from history as as inspiration and for for generating thoughts and ideas and feelings and you know because they've lived so long they need some some external sort of influence and then they say to Turlo do you want the enlightenment to which he sort of like goes oh you know shiny object sort of thing um <laughs> then shoves it towards the the black guardian who bursts into flames <laughs> and then you're like wondering what was the point of all of that? So, yeah, it, it, I, I don't <laughs> honestly don't understand. I think I think the gist is enlightenment isn't 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 the crystal. It isn't a physical thing. It, it, it's it's, it's the, the mental space of making the right decision. You are enlightened yeah. in what you do. I th yeah. think. But then within that, it seems a bit odd that the Eternals are all racing for enlightenment. On the basis that it's going to give them the power to do something prolonged and unpleasant. Um, mm. And why? Yeah, I, 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 it, it's it's a slightly was. I, I know. Um, I mean, when we did the the Who Talk commentary with Mark, um, he he does do a good Barbara Clegg impression because he said he didn't get it, and he asked her what it was. She was like ships in space, and he's like, what, 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 what's the enlightened thing there? What is that? It's like ships in space. It's like. <laughs> it, it, it kind of is, but you know, I, I think that that does feel a bit muddled. It, it, it's not yeah. terribly specific, is it? But the, the, the line's quite slight. Um, so I take it as being that that he makes the right decision, and and it's and it's it's just the situation he's in, and he makes yeah. the right decision, and he's a good person or something yeah, it's, like that. It's, but we've kind of lost. But we've spent the last two stories trying to kill the Doctor, but the Doctor's sort of instrumental in this story at the end of it in that sort of decision making. So it doesn't make any sense still. It's kind of, I think it's supposed to be like Turlo's redemption, isn't it? That he rejects all of the, you know, the, the power that the Black Guardian is offering him by, by sort of pushing it away. Because he is certainly in the first, you know, the first few stories that he's in he is very backstabby snidey you know he's he's probably bitten off more than he can chew with the black guardian but he you know he, he's um tegan's onto him quite early on you know quite suspicious of his actions and things and the the doctor seems completely oblivious uh until you get to this episode um so there is that sort of symbolic thing that he was offered all the power and rejected it i like i like the idea of the the eternals and them you know doing things for sport because if you were um you know omnipotent you would get bored you you know you need to have some sort of you know fresh ideas and creativity and things like that i mean it's it's quite a sadistic thing to do that they take these people out of time they put him in this race and then the, you know they're they're all being killed off by it by rack but i i get that bit and i and i even get sort of you know that they're they're doing it for enlightenment they're doing it for something that's gonna um keep them amused but it just gets tangled into this web at the end where they where you've got the turlo the, the concluding part of the Turlo and the I mean at least the White Guardian turned up this time because at the end of you know the the key to time it was the Black Guardian pretending to be the White Guardian but it, it just I don't know it feels kind of like oh we, we're we've got to wrap this up now so let's get you know we, we got the Black Guardian back so now we're going to get the White Guardian back in this you know series 20 uh, season 20 sort of greatest hits how many more returning characters can we get i know the white guardian i was expecting you to be cosplaying the white guardian after your black guardian uh outfit in the last uh, edition i did try and strap a seagull to my head but it flew off so <laughs> <laughs> I, think, 
the black guardian <laughs> outfit was bad enough. I'm still finding black feathers everywhere. The the the, the Tarlo thing. I think he does have his 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 full remorse thing because. I mean, the weird thing is, he tries to kill himself, and TV's Doctor Who, as a sympathetic kind of guy, shouts, don't be a fool, because that's what you want to hear in that moment. That, that's what they would tell you if you phoned at the Samaritan. Don't be a fool. Yeah, so I kind of, that's one of those moments where, like, seriously, that, that, is, that is a terrible, terrible part of that episode. Um, but he has obviously felt sorry that he does, he's in this situation, and he's finding his way out, and he does, you know, boys turned good, hasn't he? Um, but I, yeah, again, I also like the Eternals. The Eternals is a really nice concept because they're all sort of empty on the inside, like me. So yeah. they're trying to live through other sort of things, aren't they? There's a sort of they, they, there's that, that that there's a really great relation. I think it's there's the is he Mariner? Is Christopher Bro- Christopher Brown? Is he Mariner? Mariner, Mariner yeah. yes, Mariner. Um, the the notion that he's got this, it, it, it feels that it's going to be a, 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 just a love story between him and Tegan and 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 it's not because he's not in love with her because he hasn't got a concept of love because he hasn't got the feelings of love but again in another slightly weird way because she's so screwed up on the inside he's feasting on her so it's actually really dark because because it's portrayed as being oh he's he's he feels love through her but he's actually feasting on her anxieties and her upset and and how bad she is sort of messed He needs her, you know, he, and, and at the end, he, he says that. I mean, there's that whole scene where she's in that room and there's, there's the photo of Aunt Vanessa and there's the, the, um, <laughs> the um, um, air stewardess outfit hanging up as well. So it, it's really weird, you know, it, it's like, oh, we're going to show you bits of your life. We're going to try and make you feel something so that we can feed off that and and the doctor sort of comments on there being you know this telepathic element to it but it it really affects Tegan in that way that she she sees parts of her past and it prompts an emotional reaction from her. I mean I have I have (laughs) been slightly scathing about Janet for the season I actually think this is a good performance from her because it's actually probably better written than a lot of the other stories are for. Whether that's because it's a woman writing for her, I do not know whether, I'm not gonna get into the gender politics of it all, but it feels like she's got a, a sort of, a, she, she's, she, she's not just an old misery complaining about everything. There's, a, there's, a, there's more depth to it, and, and, and it feels a sort of more rounded, uh, almost warmer character, I think. It, it, it's the, I think it's her only story where she feels like a warm character, where you think, Actually, there's a human side to this 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 character, and and there's something to like here. Um, maybe it's the the fragility of the relationship because she doesn't have any sort of romantic inclinations with anyone else. Does she? And I mean, she doesn't have a romance here, but whether that's made the character slightly softer, or I don't know. But she she feels warmer in this, and I think she's a lot less. And it's, 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 it's a bit more sedate, and I think she does a really good performance in this. She's better used, um, the, like you say, the relationship with Mariner is, is, is interesting. It's not a romance, but it, but it is a connection. And she realises what sort of what's going on. And, and, and it's, I think she almost feels pity for, you know, for the Eternals that they, she's angry about it, you know, uh, and rightly so about some of the things that are happening but I think she just looks at it and goes that's that's a really sad existence that you need to to feed off uh, other people um but then there's the scene where she you know she goes over to the other ship she's in that 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 outfit she gets a bit of interaction with Linda Barron uh, and even that is quite good you know so, so Linda Barron's like oh come on there's loads of people that want to meet you and and again, you can see the reluctance in Tegan to begin with, and, and you would expect there to be a, rah, 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 you know, I'm not this, I'm not that. But she she goes and she talks to people um, and allows the Doctor to, to get on with what he's doing. You know, she 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 fits in really well here with, without the sort of jarring arguments that unfortunately are, are what's written for her quite often. 
And it's got to come down to something in the script on this one, I think. <clears throat> and I think the script is quite sympathetic and she's got quite a nice, she's woven into the story, I think, in this, in, in this particular uh, story. I think she's woven in really quite well. And, and I think you both summed up, I think it's one of her better performances as Tegan for sure. Um, and, you know, she's, she's also playing well, I think, with Peter in this one as well, when they do get their scenes together. But it's the two with her and Mariner. I think those scenes are actually really quite strong um, and, and, and certainly um, help this story along, I think. I was thinking, because I think Keith Barron, I, I think he's just a really good tennis because it'd be very easy to do Keith. dead, sort of deadpan, and for it to be boring. And he isn't. There's there's, there's 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 a lot of layers to it. And I, I, I in my head, I still can't sort of get my head, get past thinking, how would Peter Salas have done it? Because there's that that notion that because the cast changed through the strike. So so Peter yeah. Salas, Keith Barron, I, I I might err on um, Keith being a better choice for this. Um, Glenda Jackson or Linda Barron. That's that that's that's like Sophie's choice. I don't I don't know what you could do on that one. Um, but <laughs> I, I think. Um, Keith, I do think gives, gives a, a really good turn in this, and also slightly, you know, I say lower down the book. Um, I do love Tony Corner. I think he, he he's mm. it's a lovely featured part. Actually, that is it's, it's a nice it's a nice thing. Yeah, he doesn't get much to do after episode one, but he's he's really you know he's he's in there, and I think it, it's a, it's a great part for him. And um, uh, certainly, I'd uh, I'd actually forgotten he was in it, so it was quite a nice surprise when he turned up. It would have I been. Mean, Oh, sorry, come. No, 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 go for it. I, I was going to say, I, just just on what you said, it would have been really weird to have Peter Sellers and Glenda Jackson in those roles. I don't. Glenda Jackson, I always think of as, I don't know, sort of sh not Shakespearean, but like really sort of. I don't know. She should have. I should have been. I think she'd probably been more sinister because she'd have been. Yeah. She'd have been a down the line kind of. It's it's a, it's a it would have been a different show. I mean, obviously, it'd be a different mm. show because I mean, we haven't seen, we never saw Linda Barron's Elizabeth R, did we? Um, <laughs> True. But, but I, I I think you'll either love Jason, get your mama. I think you'll either love Linda Barron's turn in this, or you won't. Mm. I don't know if it's a, she's a halfway house because it is. You have to you have to make a noise, Jason. You're going to waggle. Yeah, I know. I'm, I will put the marmite up, but I love her performance in this. I think she's brilliant in this. I, I mean, it's it's a big performance, but it, I think it needs. It. I think there's a there's a there's a lift to it, isn't there? And and, and she, she 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 runs with it. There's a proper pantomime esque approach to it, and I'm not meaning that in a disrespectful way. But she is very hands on her hip, sort of. I'm the captain of the ship, and and it's, it, it's got that kind of level of performance going on. I think it's proper pirate, isn't it? So if you if you went to watch. Peter Pan, Panto. That that is every time I see this, I always think of that, and I I just see her walking out playing Captain Hook and sort of saying ah, oh, because it it is that big performance. But then you know you're just talking about Keith Barron, the the other ship is is much more sedate. You know, it's like being on a cruise liner, and then you have this sort of pirate gang who are a lot more you know, vocal and a lot more in your face about it. So I think that works. I mean, Linda, I think, is just sublime in, in the role. You know, it's she certainly makes it her own and she, she takes the focus off pretty much everyone that's in any scene that she's in, you know. Uh, even when she's not speaking, the facial expressions and the, the stance, it just, you know, it's, it's lovely. Or the laugh in the background. Her laugh is outrageous in this. I, th I think she also it wins the, it's got to win the award for campus cliffhanger ever and or two, where <laughs> she literally just does it straight down the lens and does that, rah! <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh God, it's peak J and T, I think that is. I don't, I don't think, I don't think, even, even, you know, Delta and the Bannerman, I don't think it went camper than Linda Barron having to cackle down the lens for the cliffhanger. I don't think it did. <laughs> And I love it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not hating on that. I think. I think it's great. There are very few people that can get away with that. And she's Linda Barron and Love Joy. And she certainly does. And you're right. I'm not. I'm not dissing it in any way because I think the performance is fantastic in this. 
I also like, I mean, we, we, we sort of started at the end. So <laughs> I'll just wind this back in. I also love the start in the TARDIS because I, for those people that love yeah. a TARDIS scene, I, I love that the, the sort of orange lighting. I like, I like the, the, the mood vibe and all that. And I, I think that's all quite nicely done nicely shot and I think Fiona Cummings is a great director so I think I think that all looks lovely and I, I, I like the intro to this I like the the slow reveal because you initially would think that they are on a ship and it's it's a historical because that's there's nothing to suggest that it's not a historical and so I that that I love all that and the first cliffhanger the reveal that it, they are in space and the ship's in space um <laughs> But I, I, I think I, I, the first episode really good. I love, I love the build and the reveal. And obviously, the, I think the, the whole sort of structure of this works because Linda Barron comes in sort of halfway through just to give that extra kick that it needs to take it through to the end. Mm. And it's sort of the first time, I think, that it's actually determined that the, the, the scanner eye must be on top of the TARDIS in the lamp because Mariner actually apparently climbs up the TARDIS to actually look through the view screen. And that's quite a spooky um, part of the intro as well for me. If Don't only you... Lee John had done some expressive dance <laughs> up, up, up the TARDIS screen, he could have really spooked everyone out. I mean, I, I do love the mood lighting, but it does show how shabby the TARDIS set is looking, though, because it does look really ropey. I mean, and they, and they blow it up as well in this one, don't they? I mean, it's like, it's like, how much more damage can they do to it? It was looking ropey at the start of the season. There was bits missing from underneath the console that they were covering up with black plastic bags in one of the stories earlier on in the season. Um, and then it really is on its last legs now, particularly in this story and the next one, you can see it's showing its age. But it is not, you know, and like, like you say, if you like TARDIS scenes, that is a really unusual one. I mean, there's a there's another callback, you know, because this is, season is all about the callbacks, uh, because they're sat there playing chess, which is what happened in Kinder when um, she saw the characters playing chess. So, you know, it's an, another little bit of a flashback. But the Doctor what? plays chess and Doctor and the Androids of Tara. I don't think that was any do with the Mara. No, it's she um, in the the story. She doesn't play chess. She doesn't know how to play it. But she, she's playing it with Turlo in this one. So it's just a little sort of underlying threat of another Mara story. <laughs> <laughs> What's supposed to be a third one? That, that I could... never thought there were two. It's bad enough. <laughs> Sorry, it's probably about a four with Big Finish out there. I, I, I can't imagine they've left that alone. Um, so, do we have any exotic facts about Doctor Who and the Enlightenment? Uh, I'm just having a look. So, Turlo, uh, Mark Strickson injured himself. The, the scene where he jumps off the ship, he actually injured himself doing that. Um, the lady that played on Vanessa, they got her back into the studio to do some photo shoots just, just for one day, just for that photo. <laughs> so we just want a photo of you. So they brought her back in for one day and paid her for a day photo shooting. Um, we talked about who the original cast members were going to be in. Yeah, that, that's, oh, there was a, there's, there's a story around Janet and her outfit, and apparently there was a, war, a wardrobe malfunction at some point, which, which prompted uh, Peter Davison to say, put them away. Um, and Linda Barron's outfit was the most expensive on the, this, uh, of the crew. As you'd expect, as you'd yeah. expect. Janet wasn't trying to compete with Linda's rack, was she? <laughs> That was Rack with a W, folks. Rack with a W. Keep it clean. <coughs> My there top one fact that I'll give you from the Enlightenment, should you go back and watch it again, is if you look at some of the scenes on Rack's ship with Mark Strickson, he's wearing his wedding ring. Ooh. Yeah. No, nobody, nobody noticed. So, so most scenes he's not, but there are a few we can see his wedding ring. <laughs> so keep your eyes peeled for Linda's Rack and Mark's ring. I've got one question, though, that I think needs asking. Um, where did the idea to cast Lee in this come from? Do you because mean Lee? Lee, John. Now, absolutely can't doubt his um, qualifications in the music world, but up against Linda Barron, who is 
literally in a nice way chewing the scenery and and owning that screen and you know it, it seems like probably the oddest casting choice of season 20 for sure i mean i'm just thankful it's not david van day really <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> he'd have done it he'd have done it we know he'd have done it um yeah it's not it's 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 not a great performance it's liked by people, but it's it's it, it does stick out quite quite badly. Yes, it does. But you know that's just the odd the odd the oddities of the JNT era, isn't it? You get these wild wild odd and odd decisions from time to time that you actually think not quite sure why they've done that. Yeah. But nevertheless, um, uh, just just thought I'd see what your view was on it. <laughs> So, I think, ah, uh, ah, uh, I think the <laughs> Guardian, the Guardians say, kill that, kill Jason Scores. Kill Jason Scores? That's a, that's, that's a physical, that's a physical prop, that is. That's the best prop that's so best far best we've ever prop. had. Thank you. Don't, don't push it towards Jason, he'll catch on fire. <laughs> Oh, and don't actually don't. It's a good job he didn't get it out last week when he had his when he had his pigeon on his head. <laughs> that would have caught fire. <laughs> There's this. Look, look, oh, look, look, look. This one is not playing. Ooh. All I will say, boys and girls, is if you come to to the amazing Phantom Events Utopia, I might be making Mark Strix and do all his bloody photos holding this. <laughs> That's worth the entry That's... ticket alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's a plug and a half for you. So do we have some scores for the Enlightenment? Oh, go on then. Yeah, I'll, I will go first. Um, I feel, <laughs> we were just talking earlier on about the last recording we did and the, the, the sad score for Terminus. Um, this is an improvement. I mean, it could get much worse, to be honest. This is an improvement. It's by no means a classic but there are elements of it that I did enjoy. And I think if you took out Linda Barron, it would probably be less watchable in, in the fact that I quite enjoy her performance. I like the idea of the Eternals. I get completely confused by, by the ending. And, you know, we've, we've talked about that. Um, so I did give it a fractional 5.5. Which is more than Terminus got. It's, it's almost it's, doubled. It's, it's so, because you can say that about any score you give now, it's more than Terminus <laughs> got because it's going to be generally, I think. Yeah. It's got twice as many points already, and only one of us has scored. <laughs> so. Okay, so. Uh, am I enlightened? <coughs> Am, am I enlightened with this story or not? Um, actually, the one thing I think this story has got, it's got a very sapphire and steel feel about it. Um, what you mean is overlong? No, I like sapphire and steel, particularly the scenes in the ship when, again, it's all about the reveal as you come through that first episode and then you realise it's ships in space. Um, okay, so look, I, I absolutely an improvement over the previous story, and actually not the worst story of the season by a long way. And and I think um, it was kind of like a nice release to to have this come after Terminus um, to watch. Um, I think Fiona Cummings does some great work. I think she's let down just a little bit with some of the model work in space, and I think some of the film work um, isn't isn't particularly well lit but otherwise I think she keeps the production running in a really tight way as you'd expect actually it's quite a clever script under there somewhere um, and you've got some great guest cast uh, appearances um, as she comes through um, you're right the white and black guardian bit at the end it sort of just feels a little tacked in just like it did at the end of the key to time season and the the black guardian trilogy seems to have just fizzled out really. So um, all being told, um, I think for the story um, and, for, and for Linda Barron um, and for the fact that it was better than the last one, uh, I have scored uh, Enlightenment, no fractions here, I've scored Enlightenment six. 
I, I, you know, I knew he was going to say sex. <laughs> call, call me psychic. Why? Any reason? No, I could just... Why? What are you saying is just that you've reacted to, to James's score and added half on? No, I wasn't <laughs> no, I implying that at that. all. That's what he does. He waits for me to go first and then no. adds... No. Adds half a point, and then he no. can say, I'm stingy in the comments when it goes out. No, I wouldn't do that. There's no justice, hashtag justice for enlightenment required here. I think six is a very fair score. There's some flaws, but it's not perfect, but it's 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 one of the better of the season, that's for sure. Or is there a call for the hashtag justice for enlightenment? Because I think, actually, you two are a miserable pair of old Marys. That's what I think. Oh, Ooh, we could yeah. be having a contrary. Yeah. Yeah. I actually really like enlightenment. I've, I haven't said anything horrible about it, actually. No, 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 no. Ah, not. you see, yeah. Um, I have this first on VHS. I always like it on the on, on the VHS. I'm not sure about the cover of the video, but I always just like the the, the VHS. It's one of my favourite stories. There, it's probably one of my favourite Davisons. Yeah, yeah. Can you say, can you feel the tan coming now? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? <laughs> From one to ten, oh my lord! If we did it, it's not. No, I mean, you know, it, it is. It is though one of my favourite Davisons, and I don't know whether it's a bad sign that it's one of my favourite Davisons, and it's still not going to get a ten. Um, but no, I like all of it. I, 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 if 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 I have to watch, if I have to watch a fifth Doctor story, um, I think like one of my choices. I quite like it, and I awarded Doctor Who and the Enlightenment. I awarded that to and the Enlightenment. Hate. Ooh. Because I don't feel hate. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So, eight points for Enlightenment brings it up to 19 and a half. Not quite, not quite the 20 of the season. <laughs> wow. Season 20, 29. Okay. The 19 and a half. There is one more story left for us to look at. And it is Doctor Who and the King's Demons. So, <laughs> hey! The return of the hardback. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, look, look, it's returning. I know you can't see that. It's my lighting. Oh, no. We oh, can yeah. all see that. Mark's done his little tie in there, he has. Um, all I say, and, and I know this is a this is a fact I like to churn out. It's quite a long book, and it's quite a long audio book. Terence Dudley knew how to pad. <laughs> he knew a pad. Anyway, um, who who has an introduction, and does it begin? Begin. It is the fourth of March, twelve fifteen. No, but mine does start with it's twelve fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, uh, it's 12 <laughs> do you want me to tick it off as we go <laughs> it's not going to be the same I trust me I put it's 12 15 and there are some dodgy accents a dodgy king and a dodgy anagram the master is back and he's brought with him a new toy um so in in the tradition of season 20 drum roll please we have another recurring character so we have <laughs> master coming back in actually do you know what this the disguise on this one it it, it is slightly better i feel than some of the others but um it is still i uh, i feel still recognizably him. I, I i got him from the back of his wig with he wasn't <laughs> even in shot and i worked out who it was just from his wig. Um, what can I say about this story? It's only two episodes long, which is quite nice. Really? <laughs> because it's, I don't, uh, yeah. It, I, let's start with Chameleon, because that's probably where I feel, for me, the concept of Chameleon is brilliant. And I think if you had Chameleon in, modern who it, it it could really work because you could have you know recurring characters or you know comedian could change into different people each week and you've probably got a much better way of doing that 
I think the the prop itself is is quite you know for the time probably looked amazing when they first saw it but let's face it after this story stays in a cupboard until uh, it's planet of fire isn't it it's literally i think there was one tiny scene that was filmed for um awakening which they cut I, so I, you I, I can only imagine tony virgo's face when uh director of this story when he's been promised this this brand new concept um chameleon the the the, the robe the, the the shift changing robot chameleon and he's thinking oh i'm on to a winner yeah then they wheel the prop in i can only just imagine his face the weird thing is you can honestly and this is sort of like you can if it's a shape-shifting android you could just have guest star of the week you have to or you could bring back old companions because it's yeah. just what chameleons decided he wants to look like for the sake of it um I don't think I don't think chameleon's the biggest problem with this whole. I I mean there I, I I struggle in a lot of ways with this to find something that isn't a problem. Um, I think Anthony Ainley gives his worst performance in, ever. He, he's dreadful in this. the the king's castle. It's like oh no no dude no not not the accent no not that anything not that. He's dreadful. I mean, he is, he's unrepentant. Even when he switches back to being the master, he's unrepentantly dreadful. Yeah. The series regulars all look like they have checked out to go on holiday. None of them want to be in this. From the second it starts, they all look as bored as folk. Not one of them is interested in it. it it's, it's, and that's not disrespect. I'm not going to say, they all look genuinely bored. Um, because obviously this wasn't meant to be the last story of the season. They're meant to be a Dalek one, and that got lost through strike and all that sort of stuff. So theoretically, yeah. there would have been, hopefully, if it was going to be like, like Resurrection, it would have been something better to close the season. Um, but no, the, the series regulars all look genuinely bored. Um, and it's, the story's so... Pl- it's basically like a, a bad version of the Time Meddler. Now, we, we obviously all love the Time Meddler, because yeah. that that one off season two. This isn't a million miles away. It, 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 even, even down to, and I love that there's actually a line, isn't there, where the doctor goes, oh, he's just trying to, to, to it's some pretty small fry for the master. So that even TV's Doctor Who, as part of the narrative, says, bit of a crap plot. He actually is saying that. So it kind of, if in, in the spirit of bringing things back from the past, they could have had the meddling monk and it would have fit within his character more than the master to just be like, what's what's he trying to do? Just just stop him sign Magna Carta and... and and this for me is where this season epically fails in a way because you 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 hype the entire thing up about I'm going to bring back all these people on all these things from the last twenty years and you get Mara, you get Chess playing scenes in the beginning of Tardis things. You get da 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 da, but you're absolutely right. This story was crying out because it's, it is Hartnell-esque in its approach. It was crying out for like the return of the meddling monk or something that just isn't the master because it, it's just it feels horribly tacked into this story. Or I would have I would have got the master to because you know they were mentally controlling him to turn him into Adric or something. You know to really just like oh by the way here's you know one of the companions who weren't able to save. It, it just doesn't seem to be any sort of like. But it's sure, surely, if the master wants to just stop King John signing the Magna Carta, and he's just... got a tissue compression eliminator, why don't you shoot him? Hmm. Why, why go to the thing of finding some exotic alien android to impersonate him? To it's back to the Rani's thing of you can't you get dizzy walk, trying to walk in a straight line. It's so convoluted as as a sort of plan that it, it, nobody would make a plan like it. Mm. And if you're going to do a story like this, where the plan and the general plot is so awful, you've got to have lots of really well-written characters around it that, that make you engage with it. And it doesn't. And again, and this is another look, the point, the, the point's coming out now. <laughs> the finger. The finger of, of disapproval. One of the biggest things that really gets my goat about the, about the King's Demons is the fact that it absolutely 
pisses up the wall a really good cast. There is an amazing, you've got mm. Frank Windsor, you've got Isla Blair, you've got um, Chris Villiers, you've got Michael J. Jackson, who are all really good. And they have got bugger all to do. And they pedal and they pedal and they, they give great performances. They pedal, but there is nothing to pedal. Someone has stolen the wheels from the bike. There is nowhere you can go with this. Anger management. Out with anger, in with love. <laughs> You're saying everything that I would be saying exactly the same. It's got, it's got a fantastic guest cast, but you're right. Everything's just so underused. And I don't know if that is because it feels like the story is, it almost feels like it's either been written in a bit of a rush to fill the gap that's been created by the technical issues that have been going on with the, 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 the strikes, et cetera. Or it was a, originally a four-parter that was squashed to two. I don't really know the history of this one in particular. It's sort of a, a small, small story, isn't it, really? But it just doesn't feel like it's got a, a, a it's got a beginning, obviously, it's got an end, but it just doesn't feel like it's got very much in between it. Feels like a space filler, a padder it, in it the is. middle of I mean, a season. The end of the last story ends with Turlo saying, Take me home. And then the end of this story. Um, he, the doctor turns around to Tegan and says, well, I'll, I'll take you home. And she's like, but I'm not asking for you to take me home. And then Turlo's like, hang on, when are you supposed to be taking me home? It's like the characters don't know. No, she does. What... She, has a, she has a moan, doesn't she? She's like, I don't, I don't want the android on here. And then he's like, I'll take you home then. <laughs> I'd, <laughs> and I'd rather brutal. have a random android that has been trying to cause shit than have you on this ship. Take it or leave it, love. And that, I, that, again, that's another kind of like, it's that strange character because the, the Doctor Who and Tegan were getting along really well last week. And now he's like, Android or Tegan, I'll yeah, the Android. Take you, all, take you all the way back to the Ark of Infinity when he pulls a face at the end of the story. Because <laughs> she's coming back on board and he couldn't wait to get rid of her at the back end of this one. Because, again, the character's written so badly. All she does for the first episode is moan about how cold it is. Mm. Well, love, if you think it's cold, maybe put, put some trousers on because your skirt's disappearing there. You're going to be a bit cold. Part one was the 600th episode. I mean, it's, it's not really a celebration, is it? <laughs> it's and a commiseration <laughs> for what's to come. <laughs> I, 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 oh, I can't, I can't, I can't sort of... It's funny because I dislike it in the same way I dislike terms in that it's, it, I remember um, the excitement of getting the, the five doctors set, the, the, the video set when it was a double pack with a, with a yeah. photo album. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the thrill, because I love the five doctors and I think you, you, it's just, it's just what it is, isn't it? It's like a Christmas cake. You just love it. Um, and having that and seeing all the extra bits, even though it's just bits of extra corridor and alternative takes that weren't as good, it was a thrill seeing the five doctors. The, 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 <laughs> the King's team, it's just sort of, it, it's gate crashed the party, like nobody asked it to be in the box <laughs> set. But the only way they were going to get someone to buy it was to pair it up. King's team and take the, the, it. The, the five doctors feels like all your Christmases have come together after watching these two episodes. It, it genuinely does. It's this, honestly, there's very little redeeming in this one again. And, and I can't believe that we've had this season so far. We've had, it's really, it feels like the whole season has stuttered for some reason. Mm. And the it's end of this one feels so incredibly rushed, doesn't it? They, I, I wound it back, actually. It's, got, it's quite rare for me to do this. I wound it back because I thought, maybe I've, I've missed something. Because it feels like, but they just go. <laughs> he just, just walks just off. He said, he said I, I've already set the coordinates and walks off. And that's the end of the episode. Yeah. You're like, we'll have it away with Chameleon. But that's it. That's the end of it. <laughs> it's, got to, it's got to find a cupboard for Chameleon to sit in for the next couple of years. And it almost feels like it surprises the master. Because he sort of stood there and he's like, Oh, they've gone. Oh, hang on. It's like it really is, isn't it? Yeah, it's just just dreadful. And again, I mean, does that come down to the writer being bad, the producer not picking the right story, or the script editor not beating this into the shape it needed? It, it it's bad. There's no there's no there's no wit to it. There's no style to it. There's, 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 there is nothing to redeem this. And 
I remember the, the, the lovely Isla Blair saying to it, to saying that actually she, she having been offered City of Death, and she said it would have been great to have done that because she could have done it with Julia. She said, then I did one, and it wasn't very good, was it? And, and that moment ago, <laughs> fine. No, it's it's not. It's, it's literally not you. You know, it's not your. Fault, but you are correct. The King's Demons is not a good one, and it's a shame. I, say, I genuinely, I think one of the biggest upsets for me, I think, is the cast that are just. It's amazing, cast. wasted. Yeah, I mean Gerald Flood. I mean, I, I, I think great as well, and and and. Just what's it for? And it shouldn't be so offensive at 50 minutes because if you usually with like a two parter, I mean, the, the awakening, which we've not done yet, is a strange thing, but it's done within 50 minutes and it doesn't upset you. Black Orchid isn't the greatest thing you've ever watched, but it, again, it's 50 minutes, and it doesn't offend you. I think the two parter thing should be fine. Uh, but there's this, it, it feels like a six parter. <laughs> I mean, it goes <laughs> on. I did that thing of going, must be near the end of part one now. And it was like 14 minutes. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, I, I might die if the Blu-ray has an extended edit. I'm hoping that there's no studio tapes. I'm hoping that Sue Molden got in there and, and, and got rid. This is where they come out with a four-parter. with <laughs> newly restored footage <laughs> of Tegan complaining it's cold. <laughs> So cold in here. It's a medieval castle and it's cold. Whole episode where she goes off looking for a blanket. <laughs> well, he puts an old carcass around her, doesn't he? She doesn't moan about that. It's like, that would stink. <laughs> That's not good. Never mind. Oh, Least said. It, it is right, though. You, 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 you compared it to the Time Meddler, actually. I sat there throughout comparing it to the Crusade, having obviously just recently done our season two reviews. So, you know, I, I'm pitching it up against something like the Crusades from the 60s. And this ain't a scratch on it. It ain't a scratch on it at all. Um, you know, it could have been anywhere at any time. And it, it still wouldn't have made any sense. The Magna Carta certainly doesn't make any sense. But honestly, it, it what a feeling that you've sort of finished the season on, on a story like this Um it's not very fulfilling and it's not the it's not the end of the season that we you know so we didn't we were going to get daleks but it's it wasn't really a terrifically good end of the season was mm -hmm. it this this story would have been over in a week so i think they were doing them to a week at this point so this story would have been over and done within a week and something and nothing isn't it i mean what was the gap between this and the five doctors uh five doctors was, was in the november was wasn't it this, so was, this was march so march, end of yeah. march yeah because imagine just ending on this and then leaving it. I mean, because, you know, we, we've talked about the five doctors, but we'll talk about them again. It, but imagine just leaving, you know, this celebratory season on this. You know, this is, you know, surprise, we brought the master back for this wonderful two-parter two and now you're going to have to wait months before you see another episode. Because the, the long lead would have been like a month, oh, a couple of weeks later. I can't have been that far out from broadcast. Is that, is that not East 83? Mm. Jason, you'd have been there. Well, come on. When was, <laughs> when was long lead? What's that, sorry? When was long lead? You'd have been there. <laughs> long lead on. was indeed. Long lead was 83, <laughs> and it was April 83. You're quite correct. He's back, in, he's back in the room. Back in the room. And in between, in between um, King's Demons and the Five Doctors, I celebrated my first birthday. Oh, and Jason celebrated his twenty fifth, so it's nice, isn't it? Rude. But he'd been celebrating his twenty fifth for like a decade. <laughs> the one I've just had was my twenty fifth. What are you want about? <laughs> it still comes round every year. It's 20, 25 years of Jason again. <laughs> Don't have to reprint the merch. It's fine. I hopefully more enjoyable than two episodes of the King's Demons each time as well. Mm. I, do, do we have, I mean, I, I think I've ranted quite a lot here. Do we have any exciting facts about the King's Demons? Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I wish I did. I wish I could regale you with interesting facts. Uh, the sword fight that 
that was all them. There was no stunts with this one. That was all them. Um, and that's why, again, that's why it looks rubbish. If they'd have, because they're, they're proper heavyweight swords and they're doing it. So it's a bit clunky. Whereas actually, get a stunt man, get a lightweight sword, make it look good, make it look a bit Errol Flynn, go for it. No, make it look clunky, slow, and unwatchable. <laughs> uh, James Stoker was the anagram in the Radio Times to, to disguise the fact that. Um, which is an anagram of Master's Joke. That was the the, the reveal. Um, that's pretty much it. It's not. <laughs> it's not even bereft of interesting facts. So, are we are we gonna are we going to score Doctor Who and the King's Demons? <laughs> well, yes, I hope so. <laughs> That was my segue into one of you kind gentlemen going, well, yes, I have a summary and a score for you, Mr. Ballard. And Very indeed, I do uh, have a summary and a score for you. And his summary is going to be longer than the two episodes, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and less entertaining. I, <laughs> I don't know if I could get any less entertaining. Um, OK, I mean, look, it, it's not a great end to the season. Um, it's two parts of... Of uh, it's two parts and it's just not it just doesn't hit the mark I think we've said a lot about it throughout this it you know you've thrown a good guest cast away lacks any sort of any sort of direction realistically and feels very rushed and very incomplete and it's almost like it was a four part and they cut loads of it out to make it two and it made no no sense whatsoever um <sighs> Never did I think that I would sit and review a season uh, and re-review a season. It's been a while since I've seen season 20 and I've gone back to it. And, and, and this has been a really interesting rewatch for me because um, it's, it's been quite disappointing at times. And never did I think I would sit here and uh, honestly score two Doctor Who stories in the same season, the same score. But I am afraid that I'm sitting back on... Um, a very low score for this one, and the King's Demons is getting one. If he was Spanish, it'd be a Juan. Juan. I, I can't, I can't, I can't give it any more than that. And and I I cannot believe that I've done this twice in in the same season. I've given a Doctor Who story one point. Hey, in this beacon of eighties positivity. What score are you going to give the King? Do you, know, do you know what? Most of the time we do these recordings, I have a score in mind. And sometimes, depending on how eloquently and enthusiastically you talk about the episodes, I might sort of look at that and go, maybe I am being a little bit stingy or maybe I am being a little bit um, over the over the top. I have to say nothing that we've talked about for the last half an hour or so has made me consider changing my score because I really wanted there to be some redeeming feature that you suddenly pointed out to me and I just went, oh, that's mind-blowing. Unfortunately, it, it's not. It, it's all the components, the, the guest cast, you know, the, all of those things should have come together even in a sort of, meandering sort of average way but it, it just doesn't it's, it's not the sum of its parts it's it's worse um and i just couldn't score it more than a one either oh uh, well do you know what for all the all the davison stands out there find nice things in the comments below i mean maybe someone out there this is their favorite story is it time to get the Marmite mug out again? No, because that would imply there's like people that really love the King's Demons. I know. Where are they? Yes. Anyway, I think I think I think I'll use my analogy. I think the King's Demons is like going for a poo and having a blowy. It's painful and disappointing. <laughs> okay. I thought that was quite. I think they could use that on the DVD cover. And I think 
having disliked it as much. I wavered on my score. I think having disliked it as much as Terminus, <laughs> I also gave it one point. Is, 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 the, is this the end of days now that we've had two stories that now have, have equally bombed? It's good news for Terminus because it means it's it's risen a rank. Yes, it has because it's four parts and we've scored it a three. Um, <laughs> I just it, do you know it's really weird because the eighties who was the was when I started you know sort of watching it on a on a regular basis. But and I I don't know what it was. I I remember these episodes being better, but it might just be because you just watched them once and then you moved on to the to the next one and we know you know it's so tantalizingly close to better who i don't know what it is but it it, it really was quite surprising and and saddening to go back and watch some of these stories because they were yeah. really bad and i think this sums this season up really we've we've gone out on a real low point again we've scored this and again it's all, all, all our own um you know, this is how we're perceiving it. You, the viewer might see it in a different way to us. But, you know, this season has suffered really all the way through it. Yes, there's been one or two good stories. But on the whole, it's been a season that I don't feel has gelled terribly well. Um, it's, it's had to carry up a whole load of baggage because it's the 20th anniversary season. And there was some idea to bring back all these, you know, old things from the Doctor's history and it was all just done so badly. I mean, Omega, there's no, there's no um, excuse for what they did there. I mean, you know, bringing back Omega, but bringing back something that is so totally different uh, in every way to the to the character that we were familiar with from the original outing. I can, I'm afraid, only blame the scripts in 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 this season and it's got to come down to the script editing um because you know commissioning scripts for a doctor who season is got to be a big task and it, and it is it's a hard task but over half the scripts this season just didn't live up to realistically you know the kind of expectations of some of the stories and some of the seasons that we've watched previously you know i think coming back off the the season two and coming into this one you know it, it's quite stark that you know the difference between the 60s and the 80s. Yes, there is a big difference, but, you know, even the bad stories in the 60s, you know, we got somewhere. I don't think we've ever scored two stories in one season as low as we have. I, I can only blame the scripts really in this season for me. Um, just a bit of a shame and, and an interesting rewatch because I thought I'd enjoy them a little bit more than I did. Mm. Yeah, I think I think the same thing because we, we, we sort of were a bit apprehensive about doing season season two because it's so long and it felt like it was going to be an epic watch and then it's like well we'll do an 80s one next because it'll be it'll go through a lot quicker because it's and it's sort of been the reverse I, I flew through season two this has been like porridge it's been so unengaging and so many so many stories I think I liked maybe I did like them when I was younger that I, I, I've just grown out of that, that's probably a bit patronizing but what I will say is um um, if you're looking, if you're looking in the votes below, and you want to say anything horrible about Davis and things, I'm the only person to have scored something highly. <laughs> I'm the only person to have scored anything highly. I gave it nine months an eight. <laughs> Nobody else has, has battled above a six here. Are you going to reveal yourself as the White Guardian now? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to reveal myself as no, no, we, we won't, we won't, we won't go there. Um, but anyway, uh, grand reveal. That means our rankings for Doctor Who season 20. Joint fifth place on three points are Terminus and the King's Demons. Fourth place is the Ark of Infinity, with a C, on 13 points. 13th, 13th, third place is Morden and Dead on 14 and a half. Second place on 17 is Snake Dance, and the winner on 19 and a half, it's Ships in Space, it's Enlightenment. Hey. In every way. <laughs> Even though we've got no idea what it was about. <laughs> ships in Space. It's ships That's all you need. In Space. That's all you need to know, Ships in Space. That's what it's all it's about. And Linda Barron. 
It's almost the Muppets. Ships in space. Ships in space. Imagine yeah. if the Muppets did enlightenment. Imagine if the Muppets did King's Demons. It could save it. It could really save it. They have Gonzo as chameleon. <laughs> Sprayed silver. I mean, no Piggy would be Tegan, wouldn't she? Just moaning. <laughs> 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 oh god i want that now i want that well anyway i am very sure because i know with the season that we're going to watch next i'm very sure the next season next week we will be nothing but positive oh oh no i'm wrong because we're going to be back we're going to be back for some five doctoring which isn't quite the season but we're going to be back we're going to be back for that so anyway thank you very much gentlemen a pleasure as always but the season wasn't. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. It's a pleasure to, t- to chat. It was not a pleasure to watch some of these episodes. I'm now going to take it off. I'm going to go and read my 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 King's Demons in bed. Um. <laughs> uh, quick, just a quick thumb. No, nothing more. Nothing more. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Comment, like, do all that sort of thing, and we'll see you soon.